The year is 1856. Paul du Chaillou, a French-American explorer, is deep in the forest when he stumbles on some tracks. It was the first time I had ever seen these footprints. I'm imagining his reaction. Heart palpitations, sweaty palms, a shot of fear coursing through the heart. Finally, finally he'd found fresh footprints, and now he'd get to see the creature that made them. That monster of whose ferocity, strength, and cunning the natives had told me so much. An animal scarce known to the civilized world. A beast the locals called the wild man of the woods. And finally, after weeks of tracking the animal, Paul Duchayou is face to face with it. Nearly six feet high, with immense body, huge chest, and great muscular arms. Like some nightmare vision that stood before us. This king of the African forests. The gorilla. Surprise, you thought this was a story about Bigfoot, didn't you? Well, it is, indirectly. I'm Laura Krantz, and this is Wild Thing, a series about Sasquatch science and society, the search for Bigfoot, and why we want so badly for it to be real. Paul Duchayou, explorer, naturalist, and the first non-African to confirm the existence of the gorilla. He wrote about it in his book, Explorations and Adventures in Equatorial Africa. And here's why his story is so relevant to the Bigfoot thing. People outside Africa thought gorillas were a myth and had for thousands of years, since the ancient Greeks. It wasn't until the mid-1840s that a European naturalist got a hold of some bones, confirming the animal's existence. Never mind that the locals clearly knew the gorillas were real. Another decade went by before anyone, namely our friend Paul Duchayou, managed to get an actual specimen. There he was, standing face to face with the monster of his nightmares. And now, truly he reminded me of nothing but some hellish dream creature, a being of that hideous order, half-man. Half beast. Terrifying. Go on. He advanced a few steps, and here, as he began another of his roars and beating his breast in rage, we fired and killed him. With a groan which had something terribly human in it, and yet was full of brutishness, it fell forward on its face. The body shook convulsively for a few minutes. The limbs moved about in a struggling way. And then all was quiet. Death had done its work. In full disclosure, they ate this particular gorilla. Well, Du Chaillou didn't, but his guides did. But other specimens he killed were shipped back to Europe, and people went... <clears throat> ape. They crowded into museums to see gorilla displays, bought sheet music for songs about gorillas. I couldn't find a recording. Sorry. People went to see the gorilla ballet in London. Sadly, I discovered, no actual gorillas danced. So a creature that Europeans had thought mythical suddenly became very, very real. And the exciting thing about the discovery of the gorilla was finding an animal that resembles us out there in the wild. A distant, untamed cousin of sorts. And if the gorilla could hide for two millennia, what does this say about Bigfoot? That question gets a lot of people very excited. They see the gorilla story as a shiny beacon of hope. It wasn't classified until 1904, the gorilla, and they're in Greek literature. The discovery of the lowland gorilla, it was the same thing. You can see the appeal, a supposedly mythical creature that the locals say exists, but there's not much real evidence. People lost their credibility with the 
Royal Academy in London, if they showed an interest in looking for this man-like ape in Africa, they would be disbarred. They would lose their uh, membership because they were looking for something that couldn't exist. A creature that looks like us and makes us think about our place in nature. Sound familiar? Bigfoot has that same appeal. And since it supposedly looks like us, are we related? Is Bigfoot a distant ancestor? The missing link? A long-lost cousin? It seems like that was at least part of the question that my cousin Grover was interested in answering. If it is real, it's obviously a close relative of humans, and that should be very important to my work, which is studying human evolution. If I ignored it, that would be, I think, intellectual dishonesty. Ah, okay. This makes total sense. Grover, an anthropology professor and arguably the world's most prominent Bigfoot researcher, had said that he didn't think Bigfoot was possible until he saw a certain set of footprints. The anatomical detail convinced him that Bigfoot was A, real, and B, related to humans. I'm finding it more than a little funny that in addition to Cousin Grover, Bigfoot might also be my cousin. Just think about reunions and Thanksgiving dinner. So in this episode, we're going to talk about family and genus, and species. And it's going to get nerdy. We'll be hanging out with some heavy-duty scientists and getting into evolution and paleontology and anthropology because Cousin Grover would have wanted us to have this background. As he said, if Sasquatch is real, it's a relative of some sort. So I'm wondering how close to me it is on the family tree. And what exactly is Bigfoot? Ape? Human? I personally like to think that it's just an undocumented primate. Primate. Okay, when I think primate, I think monkey. But hazy memories of high school biology tell me it's a little more complicated than that. Just about the only thing I remember from back then is this mnemonic. King Philip climbed over five giraffes sideways. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Each group splits off to become smaller and more narrowly defined. And a monkey, a primate, is in the order primates a group that includes all the species related to lemurs, monkeys, apes, and humans. It branches off from there into a variety of families, including the one that we share with the great apes, family hominoidea. Many of the Sasquatch seekers, or squatchers, as they call themselves, believe Bigfoot is definitely a great ape, putting us in the same family. But there are a few who go even further and tell me that Bigfoot is even more closely related and fits into the same genus as humans. We think it's more in line with the genus Homo. As in Homo sapiens. Not an ape. So we definitely don't want to go out and hunt for it and shoot it. Because, of course, it's too close to humans. I just want to note that this question of hunting Sasquatch comes up all the time in my conversations. And people have really strong opinions. I'll get into this further in another episode. Anyway, back to that idea that Bigfoot is in the same genus as humans, genus Homo. In a radio interview from 1988, Grover came right out and said this theory is bunk. It is not human. It is not humanoid. Definitely not. It is a great ape as far as mentality is concerned. If you add up all their behavior, there is nothing to indicate human or semi-human intelligence. Fair enough, but I couldn't completely dismiss the idea yet, since it's one of the main theories about Bigfoot. So I took a trip to the American Museum of Natural History in New York to spend a morning with Ian Tattersall. He's kind of a big deal when it comes to the subject of evolution. He's a paleoanthropologist and the curator emeritus of the Anne and Bernard Spitzer Hall of Human Origins. One of the things that people sometimes say is that evolution is just a story about the past. It was a touch embarrassing to reach out to scientists like him to ask if they'd talk about Bigfoot. I had already had a few scientists refuse to talk to me, and while I can't be sure that Bigfoot is the reason, it probably didn't help. A lot of people don't want to touch this topic, and we'll get into that later. But Ian Tattersall, bless him, agrees, although he makes his stance on Bigfoot very clear. I'm not representing myself as a Bigfoot expert. But he is an expert on how hominids evolved. Hominids are members of the group, the family or the subfamily, that includes Homo sapiens and its closest immediate relatives, all of them fossil. Which is why I'm standing with him in the middle of the museum's evolution exhibit. I know humans are related to monkeys and apes, but I keep hearing the words hominid and primate thrown around. 
How do those connect? Lemurs, monkeys, apes, and humans are all primates. Monkeys, apes, and humans are higher primates. Apes and humans are hominoids. So hominoids include both humans and apes. And humans alone with their fossil record, uh, with their fossil relatives are hominids. And hominids are just humans and our closest fossilized relatives. And it turns out there are a fair number of us. There are now known in the fossil record of the last 7 million years, maybe 25 or 30 species of extinct hominids that everybody can recognize. Well, maybe not everybody, but some names like Australopithecus afarensis should be kind of familiar. This is an early ancestor, lived in Africa, maybe as far back as 4 million years ago. You probably know this one because of a fossil skeleton named Lucy. Then there's Homo erectus, thought to be the first hominid species to move out of Africa and into other parts of the world. And Homo neanderthalensis, Neanderthals, not Neanderthals, our closest extinct human or hominid relative. Dr. Tattersall named lots more, but these were the marquee names, the ones I recognized. And he emphasized that these guys did not evolve in a straight line, one after the other, like that image you always see on T-shirts. What I learned is that our family tree is less like a telephone pole and more like a very bushy shrub. Yeah, much more like that than like the uh, ancient idea of uh, a slowly modifying lineage going from primitiveness to perfection. We're supposedly the only hominid species walking around on the planet today, but that hasn't always been the case. Once upon a time, we were definitely not alone. And there have been as many as eight that we know about at, uh, at a single point in time. Oh, that many? Eight humanish species cavorting around together? What we know in the fossil record is only a tiny fraction of what was originally out there. So yes, the history of the hominid family is a history of diversity. It's a history of throwing out different uh, variants on the, uh, the hominid theme and uh, seeing which survived and, and which didn't. And in the end, we threw out one variant uh, that became the lone survivor. That we know of. How long ago were there still other hominids besides Homo sapiens? Between 40,000 and 30,000 years ago, Maybe the hominid from Floris, the hobbit. More on hobbits in a moment. But by and large, it was in the period subsequent to about 40,000 years ago, in which all the other hominids we know about disappeared. So why did all the other hominids disappear? What happened? Homo sapiens is very, very unusual in having the wherewithal to eliminate all the competition everywhere it goes. And we've eliminated our closest hominid competition. We're doing a pretty good job on eliminating the apes, which are our next closest relatives and our, our closest living relatives. And uh, we're putting a lot of pressure on faunas around the world of all kinds. And that is a very, very unusual thing for a hominid to do. And it tells you something very special about Homo sapiens. Kind of seems a little scary, actually. Not necessarily something you really want to know. But who cares, you say? Where does Bigfoot fit into all of this? I swear, we're getting to it. In the last couple decades, a bunch of new, well, new to us, hominid species have been found. There's the one Dr. Tattersall mentions, the hobbit, a tiny ancient human called Homo floresiensis. Scientists found these guys in Indonesia in 2003. In 2010, bones in a cave in Siberia turned out to belong to another species, a group called Denisovans. And just three years ago, in 2015, scientists came across yet another hominid species, Homo naledi, found in caves in South Africa. But what is kind of exciting recently is these weird things that have been discovered uh, that you just hadn't um, expected and would not have predicted from what you knew before. So it's all this stuff coming in out, out of left field, which I feel is very cool. And also it uh, really does impact on this notion of this, the experimental nature, the branching nature, the diversity of the hominid family. Wild Thing fans, I have a serious message for you. If you're not already talking to your kids about aliens, it's probably time to start. Just this year alone, the James Webb Space Telescope found distant planets that might harbor life. 
Archaeologists claimed to have found mummified aliens, and extraterrestrials even got a shout-out during congressional hearings. No doubt your kids are asking lots of questions, and it could be you're not sure how to answer them. Let me recommend my new book, Is There Anybody Out There?, which arrives on Earth on October 3rd. This middle-grade book, based on season two of Wild Thing, explores the question of whether we're alone in the universe using science, humor, and fun illustrations. And it'll leave everyone better prepared for the possibility of alien life. Help kids learn how to tell the difference between science fact and science fiction. Look for Is There Anybody Out There in all bookstores and online. Or for more information, go to wildthingpodcast.com. So evolution is much more complicated and messy than people originally thought. It's the kind of mess that could hide a Bigfoot-esque hominid. If archaeologists are still finding fossils of previously unknown hominid species, I wonder how many others are out there, yet to be discovered. And what about species that we won't ever know about because there's no record of them? Like Dr. Tattersall said, the fossil record is incomplete. So it seems to me that theoretically, Bigfoot could have descended from a close human ancestor, especially if it's on one of those side branches. If that were the case, then I would say that that hominin ancestor would have to be a very early offshoot, one that arose prior to the genus Homo. Meet Dr. Jeff Meldrum. We're going to be hearing from him a lot in this series. He's tall with a neatly trimmed gray beard and a formal, polite demeanor. He basically took over from my cousin Grover Krantz as the country's leading academic Bigfoot expert. But his day job is as a professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University. He studies how certain primates, like us, came to walk on two feet. Bigfoot also supposedly walks on two feet, so it fits right in with Meldrum's expertise. And Meldrum thinks that Bigfoot might have split off from humans way, way back. Probably, you know, between three and seven million years ago, an early offshoot, I like to point to Paranthropus. Paranthropus is yet another ancient human relative with big, developed jaws. They were clearly specialized for chewing a diet that consisted of hard, coarse items. He's saying that maybe Bigfoot's ancestor split off from our ancestor. Both of those ancestors continued to evolve over the next several million years. And now we're walking around, and the descendant of that Bigfoot ancestor is also walking around. But didn't Ian Tattersall say that Homo sapiens is the only hominid species currently walking the Earth? Meldrum argues that that may not be true. I've been making a case that there is a multiplicity of species that have coexisted in the past, and and the numerous branches that have persisted uh, into the remarkably uh, recent past, if not the present, including potentially Sasquatch and what's been uh, termed the Yeti or the Orang Pendek of Southeast Asia or the Russian wild man that may be a relic Neanderthal or Denisovan. The Orang Pendek of Southeast Asia. Bookmark that. We're coming back to it. But in a nutshell, if multiple hominid species coexisted at some time in the past, why would now be any different? Why couldn't there be more than one hominid species? And that in broad brushstrokes, covers this theory of Bigfoot being more closely related to humans. But there's one other main theory about Sasquatch evolution, one I'd heard about through Grover. The best case is uh, a thing that's known from some fossil jaws in China called Gigantopithecus, and the name just simply means giant ape. Uh, And it's the easiest theory is that that's just simply still alive. They were around... uh, over most of the last million years, and they could well have extended into North America. Bigfoot as a descendant of Gigantopithecus, an ancient ape from Asia. Meldrum tells me that this is the theory that Grover put his weight behind. He did promote that uh, uh, over, over other prospects. You have something that's the right size in the right place at the right time to be a candidate ancestor. Uh, to explain the origin of Bigfoot. So if Bigfoot did descend from Gigantopithecus, that would put a little more distance between us and Bigfoot, further back on the evolutionary shrub. Remember the mnemonic, King Philip climbed over? This would move Bigfoot out of the smaller genus, Homo, and back up into the bigger family we share with the great apes, family Hominoidea. 
And now we're in Dr. Todd Disitel's territory. It is thought from the fossil record that Gigantopithecus belongs to the orangutan lineage. Disitel is a molecular primatologist at New York University. He's another person that we're going to be hearing a lot from. Disitel is a wiry athletic guy who wears hip eyeglasses, loud shirts. He's got an assortment of tattoos, including one of Bigfoot right on his arm. His office is several stories up on a busy Manhattan street, and it's packed with all kinds of Bigfoot memorabilia. But he, like Ian Tattersall, makes it clear to me that he's not a Bigfoot expert. I do not consider myself a squatcher or a Bigfoot researcher or any of those terms that they use. Okay, help me out here. Because you're on TV shows like Spike TV's $10 million Bigfoot bounty. I get to then have a far larger public exposure of science, the scientific method, DNA analysis, evolution. So why do you even give Bigfoot the time of day? When I go on a Bigfoot TV show and talk about evolution, you have to remember 75% of Americans don't believe in evolution. 50% are outright 6,000-year-old creationists. Another quarter basically believe in intelligent design. You know, evolution is happening, but God is at the keyboard pressing the buttons. Holy shit. 25% of Americans believe in evolution the way I do. I looked this up, and a poll from last year actually puts the number of people who believe in pure evolution at closer to 20%. And so I think it's very important to try to put a public face on science. I mean, it's so scary, the anti-science out there now. Climate, vaccines, evolution. Flat Earthers, I'm looking at you. I've heard people who are like, outright creationists and Bigfoot fanatics and all this stuff, but, you know, they'll listen to what Dr. Todd says. So that's why Dr. Todd so willingly agreed to sit down with me, even after I mentioned I'd be asking questions about Bigfoot. But even though he thinks Bigfoot is unlikely, he admits to being intrigued by the idea. I'm just absolutely fascinated by the whole Bigfoot. You know, I have every book written on it. You know, I... I know more about the Bigfoot lore than any scientist should. Disitel says that most of what we know about Gigantopithecus, and I'm using air quotes here around the word no, comes from a few fossil jaws and a few hundred teeth. Really big teeth. But no other more telling bones, like say a femur, have been found. So there's a lot of guesswork going on. I read that Gigantopithecus could be anywhere between six and nine and a half feet tall and as much as 1,400 pounds, a good candidate for a Bigfoot ancestor. But those numbers may not actually be true. Dr. Todd again. We don't know how tall it is. Some people have reconstructed it as bigger than a gorilla, but others have it just chimp size with really heavy duty jaws for eating really, really tough food. If you look at the robust paranthropines. Those are those ancient human relatives that Jeff Meldrum mentioned earlier. They have great big giant teeth. They're three and a half, four feet tall, but their teeth are two to three times larger than our own. Teeth are related to diet, not body size. Um, And so I think people just got carried away, you know, oh, Gigantopithecus, it must be a giant, and therefore maybe that's what Bigfoot is. And there's no way of knowing without more bones. Right now, the Gigantopithecus theory, like the Paranthropus theory, is just pure speculation. Still, I can totally buy the idea that something like Bigfoot might have existed once. It doesn't sound impossible, especially since the fossil record is so incomplete. Also, eyewitness accounts and stories about Sasquatch go way back. More on those later. But maybe, just maybe, some sort of Bigfoot-esque creature coexisted with humans. If not now, then once upon a time. If that sounds totally impossible, consider this crazy story. For over a century, people in Sumatra have reported seeing a creature called the Orang Pendek. This is that creature I told you to bookmark earlier. Well, local tribes and villagers, as well as Dutch colonists and Western scientists and travelers, they all describe a very short, hairy, ape-like thing that walks on two legs. Their accounts weren't taken seriously. Like Bigfoot, the Orang Pendek had been considered a myth. Then anthropologists discovered the bones of Homo floresiensis, that hobbit-like species. 
It's also quite short and walked on two legs. And Jeff Meldrum says that maybe this could in fact be the mythical orang pendek. Descriptions, you know, allowing for embellishments uh, still describe a little three to three and a half foot tall, um, bipedal, hairy, humanoid type of a creature. When you stack up the skeleton of Homo floresiensis, uh, it's a pretty, pretty darn good match for that. Even the discoverers of Homo floresiensis acknowledge that, uh, yes, by the way, the natives have been telling us that there's these little hairy people that live up in the mountains all along. Sound familiar? Kind of like the gorilla. I'm told that Homo floresiensis isn't around now, but it might have been around long enough to coexist with modern humans. To me, that makes the Orang Pendek stories seem a little less like just myths, and it makes the stories about Bigfoot seem like there might be a kernel of truth. And thinking back to the gorilla, that animal remained a myth and a legend until we found its bones. What was the gorilla before we had those? A joke, a way to lose your credibility. All of that changed with just one specimen. The laughing stock was now the scientific hero, and the same could end up being true for Bigfoot. I'm starting to see where the fascination with Bigfoot might come from. If it is, or was, real, it would probably be one of our closest living relatives, providing a glimpse into our evolutionary past. Who wouldn't be intrigued by that? And after hearing all this about evolution, I can't completely dismiss Bigfoot. But I'm still not sold. I want to see proof, fossilized or fleshy, before I go on the record saying that Bigfoot's real. So on the next episode of Wild Thing, let's see what kind of evidence we've got. I don't know of any cryptid that has more documented evidence than Bigfoot. If you just Google Bigfoot and Sasquatch, you'll come up with somewhere around 11 million hits. So videos, photographs, I mean, just the evidence is overwhelming. Is it? Not according to this guy. Because there's no evidence of Sasquatch, footprints are not evidence. It's a piece of the puzzle. Does it prove shit? Because you did not see what made that footprint. You don't have video documentation or photographic evidence of something making that footprint or, or killing that animal, that carcass he found. We don't have any evidence of Sasquatch doing that. And now I don't know what to think. It exists. There's no question about that. They exist as much as Irish people exist. That beer tastes good. You know, pizza's magnificent. These are all facts. But at least there will be beer and pizza. Is your love for the show evolving? Want to show that love? Leave us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. This really helps us get the word out about Wild Thing. Go to our website, wildthingpodcast.com. That's Wild Thing Podcast, all one word. We're also on the usual social media suspects. Find us at Wild Thing Pod. And if you see a Sasquatch in the wild, make sure to snap a photo, blurry or otherwise, and share it using the hashtag Wild Thing Pod. This podcast is a production of Foxtopus Inc. Special thanks to Greg LaSalle and the American Museum of Natural History. Wild Thing is created, reported, and produced by me, Laura Krantz, with help from Kelsey Ray. Alisa Barba is our editor. Scott Carney is our executive producer. Our music is composed by Ramtin Arablui and mixed by Sanaz Meshkinpour.